the online intelligence briefing, focusing on what ISR is, along with current trends and near future developments. My name is James Lloyd Edwards, and I am a C2 stroke C4 ISR senior research analyst, and I'll be moderating today's session. Presenting today will be Matteo Natalucci, who is our C4 ISR journalist, Jim Oberlin, our C3 senior research analyst, and Kostas Tikos, our C3 principal analyst. Just a brief reminder that the information used to compile today's presentation has been drawn from a variety of Jane's content, but particularly Jane's Defence Industry and Markets Intelligence Centre. For the uninitiated, ISTAR stands for Intelligence, Surveillance and Reconnaissance, whilst ISTAR adds the additional target acquisition into the mix. In my current role as a serving ISTAR Reserve Officer, there is a tendency for the terms ISTAR and ISTAR to be conflated, and indeed most of NATO treat the terms interchangeably. It is argued that target acquisition is implicit within ISR anyway, but there are some who disagree. The Australian military, for example, see ISR as a strategic stroke operational level activity and ISTAR as more tactical. That strategic element is captured in the Jane's definition, which is based primarily on NATO sources. Our definition reads, a strategic activity that synchronizes and integrates the planning and operation of sensors, assets and processing, exploitation and dissemination systems in direct support of current and future operations, with the fundamental objective of getting the right information to the right people in the right format at the right time. ISR provides the means to effectively synchronize theater or joint operating area-wide ISR requirements and activities within the overall operational campaign plan and in accordance with strategic and national intent. When we look at the C4 part of the C4 ISR, we're talking about the means of managing and moving information and not the collection elements. There's a lot of terminology in use today. As an officer, I am primarily concerned with command and control. The C4 prefix adds communications and computers to that definition. We combine the two terms to form C4 ISR. This is the sensor shooter diagram. Many of the listeners will be part of organizations within the, with their own versions of this diagram. What it shows is two different units, a ground patrol and an air patrol, spotting a collection of enemy units and sending reports back via several different means to an HQ where the data is processed and decisions are made. Orders are then sent from that HQ to an artillery unit who engage the target. In my military capacity, I subscribe to the American mantra, every man a censor and believe that every unit in the field is part of the I-Star picture, and that consequently, every soldier needs to be able to communicate intelligence. We'll be presenting three recent articles about C4SR. I will begin discussing the latest Russia's development on photonic radar technology. According to Russian state media, Russia's future sixth-generation fighter, as well as its next-generation unmanned aircraft, could be equipped with a radio photonic radar. If the Russians succeed in developing such a system, Moscow will be in possession of a sensor with a far greater range and resolution, high enough to develop, to develop a three-dimensional image of an airborne target. Potentially, such a radar could allow the Russians to develop a weapon-quality truck on a stealth aircraft if it proves to be successful, of course. Russia's RTI group is expected to complete preliminary research and development as well as build a mock-up of uh, an X-band radio photonic radar this year that will determine a principal scheme of building the radio photonic locator. One well, of the key points is that this is a cycle. The commander says what he needs to know and his staff work out how to answer those questions and task or request assets to do so. They deliver information back which is processed into intelligence and disseminated to those who need it including the commander who then adjusts his information requirement. In a conventional land environment, this process will lead to something looking like this. The red arrow indicates an enemy axis of advance, and the squares and thumbtack symbols represent named areas of interest, locations where ISR assets will be focused to find the enemy or to potentially gain a more dedicated picture of them. Network-centric warfare continues to transform the Milcom market. The top five segments shown, shown on this chart enjoy their revenue because they build a network communications capability for voice, data, video, and imagery linking data centers and command elements by SATCOM and fiber optic cable to software-defined radios and tactical environments. In the U.S., network-centric warfare has transformed the MILCOM market for 20 years. 
in other countries, these concepts are driving new programs and revenues. New Zealand will achieve a network-enabled army over the next 12 years with communications as one element of the program. This capability was deployed in an environment where conflict between advanced nation states was no longer expected to occur and operations focused on an arc of instability. Where network capability only had to worry about physical obstacles, weather, and counter IED jamming, the A squared AD threat means that network communications must be maintained in the face of opposing forces that want to deny it through cyber attack, jamming, denial of SATCOM, and kinetic attacks on C squared and communications nodes. The C2 market captures various equipment types and programs ranging from tactical dismounted battle management solutions to strategic and enterprise level command information and decision support infrastructure. It covers mission compute, storage, and onboard networking, along with provision of services and R&D across 15 functional segmentations. Some of those include battle management, air defense, ISR, command and theater, as well as strategic C2, and furthermore, logistics, combat support, air traffic control, coastal surveillance, and maritime surveillance. Moving on to electro-optics. Electro-optics and infrared systems, otherwise known as EOIR, include sensors and emitters working within the part of the electromagnetic spectrum ranging from visible light all the way through to infrared wavelengths, including the ultraviolet spectral region. EOIR systems featuring both civilian and military applications for land, air, space, and maritime domains. Example of defense equipment here include image-intensified personal weapon sites, night vision goggles, fire control systems, armor fighting vehicle driver viewing systems, multi-sensor stabilized gimbal turrets, laser range finders, airborne reconnaissance pods, military warning detectors, as well as satellite helicopters. So that concludes the main piece. I'll present our key takeaway points and move into our Q&A session shortly afterwards. So we have drawn out these key takeaway points from across our C4SR analyst team. I won't read them all out, but I'll add one of my own. In general, the ability for C4ISR stroke C2 capability is constantly being brought closer, if not on, the edge of the battle space. Technological and computational, computational militarization shows no sign of abating, enhancing old capabilities and creating new ones entirely. As referenced at the beginning of this presentation, every man is a sensor, and increasingly the C2 space between forward and rear deployed elements is constantly decreasing. I hope you're able to join us for the next future briefing, which is the US DOD FY20 budget and the first look being held on Thursday the 14th of March at 1500 UK time stroke 10 Eastern time. Thank you and goodbye.